Good morning to for a great day uh, today. Uh, Samir, come here, uh, and of course uh, for today, as uh, you know, we are celebrating our 120th, 120th uh, episode. So 10 years of uh, complex CCC live cases. So which started. I would just want to show up two minutes, uh, but more important uh, first uh, uh, point would be. Uh, key uh, the we make this event one we did the hundredth episode and then now the hundred twentieth episode uh, and today it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, have uh, the esteemed and great uh, expert faculty uh, to join us today and uh, those who have been watching I see many of you are here so that I don't would not put any additional time in terms of introduction but we have three our guest faculty. Uh, with uh, Dr. Gibson, Dr. Waxman, and Dr. Uh, uh, Samadhi. So key will be that they will have uh, individual topics which you all have, the small, small uh, presentation, and then question answers. So whole, uh, we want to make this an uh, educational event. Before that we start, very briefly, will take me two minutes to just show how and where we are now. So key, if you uh, just want to say that I always, uh, with uh, myself and Anu, the plan was that how can we educate people globally? You can do it in your yearly conference. You go to a little symposium. You have evening. You know, I was doing every four month referring physician dinner, bringing 50 people. Uh, then, of course, uh, so and so forth. But how can you do global? So it requires thought process that not a, uh, a taped cases do live. And question is how you do live. So that time, of course, uh, with Samir Mehta, a great uh, friend. Uh, knowing that he was with a Lumen, he has been done a lot of global work. We met with various companies that how we will relay, how do we will we host, uh, where it will be if you want to do the cases. So we planned. So it took quite a bit and the final decision was made in the, that how we are going to do it in TCT of 2008 in October. So right the, for three, four hours we say how we are going to do. Then the plan basically was that we e-blast the case. Then, uh, of course, select the tough case, uh, advertise, then show the case during the per performance, and then give some educational lecture also of the latest data available in the literature. And then, of course, the entire discussion, and then wrap up uh, with the take home message and the question answer. So, that is how we started at the first, and we say, well, best way would be third Tuesday, because I know that Tuesday. Uh, I never travel, always here, and keep 8 to 9 a.m. And just to give a historical background to our uh, guest uh, friends, the Tuesday is our busiest day of the lab. Uh, we usually do about anywhere between 22 to 32 uh, interventions and goes past midnight without saying, and of course, in the morning, some educational activity. So we selected the third Tuesday uh, of the month and 8 to 9 a.m. Uh, and this was our actually first webcast as shown here. Uh, after the initial plan. So we started at, the question is, how do you get the partner? We were trying to talk to some companies and so nobody was interested. I said, what are you talking about? You, you showing the live case, if what happens if uh, we sponsor and patient dies? So it's a trouble. So there are a lot of issues happen. I said, no problem, we'll start. So we started the first case uh, by, by my own funds, uh, no sponsor. In the first case of July 21, 2009, and we actually have a seven, we thought maybe it will be 100, 200 people. The first one, we have 729 hits and live viewers were like 200 or so at that time. The quite a bit live viewers. So really started the concept and concept was of the global teaching in this format of the case presentation, performance of the case and didactic discussion. So that led to within three months, Cath Lab Digest got interested and they said, well, we'll partner, we'll sponsor you. So they came. Uh, October 2009 and our viewership from uh, three digits went to four digits about one to 1000 to 2500. So after about one plus year hard.org got involved. So they became our sponsor and uh, the, clearly what it did is increase the viewership right away. Overnight doubled more than doubled uh, one year uh, later September to, to 2010. So then ACC got interested in July 2012. So what ACC did, we thought that uh, ACC will be less than hard.org, plus minus, uh, actually Jagat was very instrumental to get this affiliation. 
and uh, we thought maybe ACC will be less, but we kind of agreed with them. We have the page on the ACC, and uh, it became much more than even what we were with hard.org, six to eight thousand. And one case actually was thirteen thousand plus hits. That was the case which we had complication. Uh, I would say the major complication in this hundred twenty cases is only one, and that patient we actually it is recorded there uh, of the June two thousand. At the 13, the patient was doing a CPR uh, because patient had a, a total cardiac stent still. But then uh, the cardiac surgery came. Uh, they put the ECMO, did the PCI, and that patient actually ultimately walked out. Now happened to be just like the moderator, uh, the Spencer King was there on that day, and he actually saw when we showed the pictures and then when patient went home and all the data. He wrote the editorial in uh, September of 2013. That how patients who develop complications at Mount Sinai walked out is because of the teamwork and expertise. So that was a tremendous uh, uh, achievement uh, came out from our uh, uh, this uh, live cases. So then, so question then was there are some issues happen. So uh, in June of 2014, uh, for various reasons, uh, the ACC withdraw. They say, well, we don't want to. One of the big reason was that many other centers uh, wanted to become part of the live. That's what we were told. I said, you know what? It has to be exclusive. They do some other day. That's not a problem. It's actually TCT. That way, wanted us to be part. But they said that you have to rotate now with Columbia. And so I said, no, this is we started. You can add on. We have nothing wrong with that. Add on additional day. It's not a problem. So that is how we broke with ACC. And I can tell you, you know, rarely I get depressed in my life with this vision and getting to about 8,000. And we say now ACC breaks up. We thought that we were going to fall apart, that we will go back to what we were there in 2009, 2010. But to the credit of this team, of TRIO, myself, Heaney, and Mehta had developed that much, uh, I would say, confidence or the, the uh, basically uh, the people followers. So it actually not only decreased, it rather increased because what happened now, we could advertise into various other social media. So those were the YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, then we added. And now it's actually average about 8,000, sorry, minimum 8,000. It's about 12,000, some cases 18,000, and one case actually is 38,000. This is the case of bifurcation LED diagonal with a two-stent approach. It was not even Impala, bifurcation LED diagonal. So this has been a tremendous journey. So now 10,000 are the minimum and has been a tremendous success. Now. In all this, common in all 120 episodes. Samir Mehta as the moderator, 120 times. Uninterrupted, whether it's a snow, the, the railroad may be closed, the flights are canceled, doesn't matter. But all 120 episodes, he has been here, and it's tremendous. And another common in all 120 episodes is the Anpur Nakini doing all 120 cases. So I really, uh, and that's just to give you uh, the overall numbers that how it has grown, uh, like minimum now eight to 10,000 per month for last uh, uh, about nine, 12 months. And this actually has been possible. The, this is the CCC live. And then we have the page views of the YouTube, another 10 to 12,000 per month, which are not counted in this. Uh, and uh, views by the country, USA on the top, second is India. Third is Germany, Turkey, UK, and Pakistan. So one of our fellow will be going back, Assad. Maybe we'll increase it to, yeah, to increase further. So total 132 plus countries, uh, and uh, great. Now, actually, what also, we did various experiments during it. We say, well, we do a two simultaneous translation. We did Chinese, we did Spanish. Uh, and so we didn't, we actually, we are very disappointed with the Chinese. We had to create a separate channel. We brought the Chinese interpreter, did not increase. China actually is very low. I don't know why. China in terms of uh, 132, I think China is like 90th. Maybe they have censorship. Yeah. yeah. What is it? 90th. They were like 90th with such a... Yeah, no, but even we got a Chinese translator. Yeah, but you can't get on the... But the government yeah. make a censorship. Ah. You can't open it. I YouTube see. YouTube is not... <laughs> YouTube is not... Or CC is live. Yeah. 
You have to do it with Alibaba. WeChat. Yeah. WeChat. Yeah. WeChat. You want to WeChat and Baidu. You gotta do WeChat. WeChat. We will think about that. Yeah. WeChat is there. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way they can do WeChat. Yeah. For the all the apps, now they have contacted from China. I see. That they want, uh, you know, uh, some uh, conflict of interest off from Mount Sinai, so they can translate it into China. Plus, they have a different kind of a mobile uh, something that they yeah. want app, right? So they want it uh, changed to their language. No God, go to Alibaba. Well, we d we'll, d we'll come back to that. Uh, two or three translations simultaneously will make it happen. And this is just to uh, sum up uh, that all uh, the, the downloaded, all the available CCC Live with the YouTube channel, 2500, the CCC uh, Facebook pages, about 2000 plus uh, always, and the Twitter, Instagram, um, quite a bit uh, job done by Kim, and the live viewers, so which used to be about uh, seven, like four, five hundred. Any time live view uh, has become 1,600, 2,600, taken all those together. So just to say the tremendous journey and thank uh, the entire team, besides three of us, take the great credit, but many other people involved and uh, backbone has been our cat lab and particularly the interventional fellows, performance of the case and my other uh, attendings. With that note, we'll start our educational and we'll, there is a little uh, change uh, in the, in the, uh, the program. And that is that we'll ask the first uh, Dr. Ron Waxman uh, to talk about detecting the vulnerable patient and vulnerable plaque in the cath lab. Ron, thank you for to be here and we really appreciate uh, taking time and be here with. Thank you very much. And um, first of all, thank you for the invite to be part of this uh, celebratory case. Uh, we have really good ties with Sinai. Uh, I think it's about 10 years that you're coming every year to CRT. And uh, many of uh, the people here are my best friends, uh, from Jared Narula on the first row to Roxana to others. We also were proud to get the first women live case ever transmitted with Dr. Kinney. Uh, so it's really a lot of uh, relationship that has been developed and friendship. And again, if whatever you like to use any of the CRT to host, to collaborate, we're not gonna ask anything in return. Uh, we, you, you have it actually open-handed to us uh, to help to promote and increase the penetration of this very important um, function. So I'm going to talk about a topic that some of you are very expert. It's a very um, provocative. These are my disclosures. And we're actually asking ourselves several questions that I'm not sure that everybody is in agreement that there is an answer to that. And they have been surfacing for over two decades. Is there a vulnerable plaque? And if there is, can we identify the vulnerable plaque prior to the event, primary or secondary? And if identified, can we prevent the event? And what are the potential therapies for the vulnerable plaque? And what are the key trials that will address these questions? So I'll try to address it in a very short presentation. But first, maybe we should differentiate between the primary versus the secondary. The primary event is the surprise event. This is someone who woke up at the street, never had any issues, and boom, he getting a heart attack. Now, can we diagnose it prior to that? Uh, I'm not sure we're ready yet, but there are studies with CT, PET, core registered They're expensive. We cannot screen the entire population, but there are more measures to see, uh, other than uh, medical therapy, some imaging that potentially can detect primary prevention of vulnerable plaque, but we're not there. What about secondary prevention? This is meaning during the PCI or post-PCI. And that can be potentially diagnosed by intravascular imaging, whether you use IVUS VH, OCT, NIRS, et cetera, angioscopy. And again, what it does, it helps you to differentiate and understand better the morphology. So these are some features that you would differentiate between vulnerable plaque that causing thrombosis, which would lead to event, like rap plaque rupture, plaque erosion, or calcific nodule. And there are some other plaques that consider to be non-causing thrombosis, and you don't have to be alerted, like fibrocalcific plaque, healed rupture, and intimal thickening. On those at the bottom, you don't have to actually intervene because 
you don't think that they're going to create a, an event. Now, again, to understand this whole topic of vulnerable plaque, we have to identify what is considered to be vulnerable plaque. So that would be a plaque that will have lipid in the plaque. It would have a thin cap fibroatheroma with rupture of 70% of all lipid core. It will have erosion with no obvious rupture. In that case, you have about 30% lipid pool. In both, about 50% have a lipid pool. And then you have the calcific nodule. And just that you'd know that approximately 85% of the plaque causing sudden death had a lipid core or lipid pool. So that's direct us at least to the whole lipid core within the plaque. Now, again, there are many studies by imaging. I'm going to mention some of them. I'm going to focus primarily on NEARS because this was our last work on the field. But OCT did show that there is a difference when you have a non-lipid-rich plaque by OCT versus a lipid-rich plaque by OCT. And again, you can identify lipid-rich pool here, as you can see here on this OCT image. And apparently, if you follow those patients for three years, you see that if you identify a lipid-rich pool within the OCT, this patient is going to have more events compared to those who are not going to have. So OCT does help you, but again, it's not that easy to diagnose. You need more patients to prove that, but that was not a small study. Then you have angioscopy, that only Japanese are doing that. Uh, they are actually can identify lipid rich plaque within the uh, angioscopy, but I'm not sure anyone in the US is doing, and it's not that practical. The most important trial in this field was a, the PROSPECT trial. This was basically a natural history trial with 700 patients who presented with ACS. They had either non-STEMI or STEMI. They were undergoing one or two vessel PCI following by three vessel imaging. And they have QCA of the entire coronary tree with IVUS and virtual histology. And then there were a best medical treatment, and then there was a repeat imaging if an event had occurred. What they showed is a typical case like that, that you have an intermediate lesion in this LED, which you can see by the arrow. And then when you do the imaging, which was that time was done by IVUS and uh, RF IVUS, which is VH, you could see FFR, don't treat, 0.90. MLA, don't treat, 4 millimeter square. Plaque burden was 72%, and there was a presence of a TICFA. This is what happened with the patient uh, about a year later. And you can see that there is a total occlusion. He presented with STEMI. And uh, it is a classical case of what we think is a vulnerable plaque. And the goal of that study was to see, can we identify features that will tell us that this patient will have this event? Because the angiography is not strong enough to merit an intervention. Overall, in that study, we have seen that there were 20.4% with any event. On the culprit lesion, which was mainly restenosis or thrombosis, there was about 12.9% event in three years. 11.6% were non-culprit lesion related event. These are the ones that we are focusing. These are the ones that we want to prevent. And there was a small group of 2.7 that they couldn't determine which were the culprit or non-culprit. And also what was found that if you have the combination of TICFA plus black burden more than 70% and MLA less than 4 millimeters square, that's going to be giving you the highest predictability to have an event in a null culprit lesion. Now, in the real world, even with great operators in this place, to start to look on these whole measurements and to start to, it's not very practical. So this technology, even though it did show that you can get some features that would suggest an event, and primarily the plaque burden, which as you can see here, that was the highest correlate for non culprit event of 9.5%, it was not that practical. So people were not using that much. And also their ability to identify tick for yes, no, calculate the MLA, it was not that uh, simple. And 31.3% patients had more than one lesion with plaque burden greater than 70%. So does that mean, are we fixing all those high plaque burden lesions? Not sure that that's true. So then came the LRP study, which actually representing a study within a new technology that incorporate IVUS and NEARS. And again, in this institution, I don't want to explain much because you were the first one to do the color registry at uh, the, uh, I think it was the lipid, uh, the yellow, the yellow, 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 that's right. 
And I'll tell you a little story that when you did that yellow, we were working on that uh, uh, technology as well. And Jim Muller came to us and he says, how come you abandoned us from that study? I mean, how come we're not part of that? He says, Ron, I'll get you to do the LRP study, but you'll have to fund half of this on your own merits because everybody gives us a very high ticket. So there is some relationship. I mean, what was triggered me was I was angry that we were not part of that. And that's how we got to be that LRP. But then the technology combines IBUS and NIRS. And this NIRS histology was validated. Uh, this NIRS technology was validated by histology with the uh, cadavers, uh, which they were running the imaging. And they could say that there is a nice correlation between the histology and the chemogram that shows the LCBI. Now, what is the LCBI? So you have a chemogram. On the chemogram, you have, when it's yellow, you see lipid-rich plaque. When it's red, there is no lipid-rich plaque. And the LCBI is the lipid core burden index, <coughs> which is run from a scale from 0 to 1,000. And the highest the lipid uh, <coughs> core plaque burden that you have, the higher chances that you have the event. These are five cases. All of them had the presented with ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia and came to the cat lab with a STEMI. Most of them had CPR. They were done by uh, Ryan Mader, who actually had the system in his facility, and he actually did imaging in all of them. All of those guys had, as you can see here, a high culprit maximum LCBI of greater than 400. Some of them even had 65.8 and even 800. So these are really anecdotal cases, but very impressive. These are guys that actually had the kind of sudden death. That's what we're trying to prevent. So what they had, they had an evidence of high LCBI. So I'll give you another case, uh, for example. This is a very young guy, right, 33 years old, presented with non-STEMI. He has a culprit lesion in the distal RCA. No one doubt that we have to treat that. Here is the angiogram. It has been fixed uh, with the STEMI in the distal RCA. And then there is also an angiogram of the LED. And what is that angiogram shows? It shows that there is maybe disease, uh, but only moderate in the LED, nothing that we would treat. I mean, we can do an FFR here as well. Uh, but this patient also had a chemogram done by NIRS, and you can see that there is a lot of yellow there. And the question, do you treat it or you don't treat it? Uh, is the presence of the lipid-rich pool by NIRS is a marker for patient who have a high risk for CV disease. We didn't know that answer, and actually this patient was followed with medical treatment, and the question whether the lesion will cause an event or not was addressed, and you can see here, the plaque burden is 75%, so that's a feature of high risk. <coughs> MLA is slightly less than four, it's 3.9, and the max LCBI is 377, less than the 400 that we believe that would be the threshold. Come back to that case in a moment tell you that there are several studies that did actually set up a threshold of pretty much 400, but what was consistent that the highest the LCBI, the highest likelihood that you will have an event. This is a study that was uh, called Ateroma NIRS that look at quantiles from one to four. The highest actually did show more event on patients that were followed overall for four years. So we had the several studies also like this one by Ryan Mader that was published in the European Heart Journal, also showed that if you have a four millimeter max LCBI, you're gonna have more event. This was all on the patient level, not on the plaque level, but they were consistent. And also the higher the LCBI, the more event you have within the patients. And again, it was consistently shows with sensitivity, which was moderate and specificity, which is relatively higher for the four millimeter max LCBI greater than 400. So this 33 years old patient, which I just showed you, uh, indeed presented again with angina 15 months later. And guess what? He has a total occlusion of the LAD. So the question now, how can we make the field change? I mean, that was the topic that you asked me to talk. Can we detect the vulnerable patient? Can we detect the vulnerable plaque? I cannot bring you a better case than this one, but that's not good enough because they'll tell me we are in the field of anecdotal medicine, right? So we had to do a study. Here you can see it's the baseline and 15 months later, right? I mean, it's very, very impressive. And this is the uh, chemogram on this patient. So we came with the idea that actually uh, started with Jim Muller and we helped him in our center develop this study. 
Uh, to address the question, does NIRS detect vulnerable plaque or vulnerable patient or both? And that was called the LRP study. It was an international multicenter prospective cohort patients. We enrolled over 1,500 patients who underwent multi-vessel NIRS IVOS imaging between February 2014 and March 2016 with two hypotheses, the vulnerable patient hypothesis and the vulnerable plaque hypothesis. And the aim was to see whether we can identify those events on the patient level or on the plaque level during a period of 24 months. There were basically two co-primary endpoints for the vulnerable patient and the vulnerable plaque. And the key secondary endpoints was to check whether the 400 cutoff is really going to identify on the plaque level the event. And there were also those uh, events that we actually looked at them. There were serious events, cardiac death cardiac arrest, non-fatal MI, acute coronary syndrome, revascularization. This is not like funky events. This is really events that you want to prevent. This was the study flow. We screened about 5,273 patients. We enrolled 1,563, and we evaluated all their LCBI. Those who had greater than 250 enter into the study. Those who has less than 250, because of monetary issues, they were randomized. Half of them were followed. Half of them were not followed. But the randomization was done correctly. And uh, overall, you can see here, these were the clinical presentation of those patients. Not all of them came with ACS. Some of them initially came with stable angina, about 36.8%. And the overall MACE on those patients over the time was 8.8% total MACE event, and, and non-culprit was about 87 and 2.3% underdetermined. This is the adjudicated patient level events at two years, and again, indeed, you see these are true event, cardiac death, cardiac arrest, ACS, no fatal MI, MI rehospitalization, a lot of PCI and cabbage. Now, the primary endpoint of the study for the vulnerable patient showed that for each 100 units increase of maximum LCBI at 4 millimeter, the risk of non-culprit mass increased by 18%. And a patient with maximum LCBI at 4 millimeter greater than 400, greater than 400, is at 87% higher risk to develop non-culprit mace, which actually confirms the 400 threshold, which is a good threshold. And here you can see here, if you had less than 400, the event rate was 6.3%. If you had greater than 400, the event at two years was 12.6%. This is a patient level event. We also look on plaque level. We have obviously less plaque level events because you had to also be able to cap them. And on this one, we saw that for each 100 unit increase of max LCBI, the hazard ratio was 1.45. So that means increase of 45% in the non-culprit MACE event. And if you look at the threshold for the plaque level, it was fourfold greater higher, which give you a, a hazard ratio of 4.11 for an event on the uh, plaque level. So again, if you did not have a plaque level, it was 0.8% if you don't have the 400, if you're greater than 400, on the plaque level, you have a 3.7% within the plaque to have an event. Now, here is another case from this study specifically. You can see here that lesion in the LAD, patient presented in April 2014, intermediate lesion. You see that the max LCI is greater than 400. You see the IVUS doesn't have a lot of plaque burden. And then he has event about a year later, or two years later almost, uh, that, that uh, in that LAD, it's not MMI, but it's unstable angina, and you see how tight is that lesion in the LED where you had the LCBI, right here. Not at the bifurcation, which you think you would be, just proximal to that. Really corresponding to the yellow, which is again what we try to show in this study. So again, for the time, I'm going to jump on the summary, which summarizes what I said. I would say that this was just corroborated by another study, study by David Erlinger that was published at Open Heart, and also using the cutoff of 400 showed if you have more than 400, look at the MACE event versus less than 400. And he also looked on correlates between plaque burden and LCBI. And you can see here that plaque burden greater than 70, uh, the hazard ratio is 0.61. But if you have max LCBI greater than 300, 400, 500, you're in the range of 3 to 4 point something. So clearly, the LCBI is a very strong correlate. There are some other prospective studies that looking into that, the PREVENT trial that looking on MLA less than 4 millimeter plaque burden and also lipid-rich plaque greater than 500. And they're looking on also treatment. So now what do you do with that? You're giving 
optimal medical treatment or you're putting BVS or now in other stands since BVS is not approved. Prospect 2 is on the same line, 900 patients based on the prospect criteria, but also looking on the NEARS and also treating with initially absorbed now with Zions and this patient com at study complete enrollment. So what's the clinical impact of all this? I think that we have to implement this in our current practice and understand what's the LCBI. What shall we do if we have high LCBI? That's subject to another study. Uh, there is a study that's going on right now looking whether you treat high dose statins of PCSK9 specifically will reduce the yellow very much to repeat your yellow study but with PCSK9. But the question, should we treat those patients with PCSK9? Should we give them high dose statins? Should we give them any other inflammatory? Should we give them a DES? Now I would submit to you that we lower events rates of DES less than 3.7% at two years, we can think about starting to treat those lesions with a drug eluting stent because on usually stable lesions, not stenotic, the event rate is less than 3.7% at two years, but that's subjected to a clinical trial. So we have to look at these clinical trials. We have to look on, maybe we'll have one day back the BRS technology, but this is very promising because now you cover here nicely the lipid core and you have very nice healing, so you don't leave anything behind after 60 months. So again, if this technology will ever come back, that's another attractive way to treat those patients with a vulnerable plaque. And again, going back to this patient, what do we do today? 65-year-old man, exertional angina. Uh, should we treat this intermediate lesion? FFR 0.88, LCBI 568, at approximate 361. Should we treat it, not treat it? Well. I cannot advocate yes today because we don't have the therapeutic study, but tomorrow once we'll have the results, and I'm pretty much optimistic we'll be able to show that we can reduce events and we'll change the standard of care based on this imaging. So I'd like to thank everybody. And everybody is in the room invited for CRT next year. If you want to give a talk or submit an abstract, let me know. It's just going to be in a bigger venue uh, and you're all invited. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Are you believing any questions uh, for Dr. Waxman? Where's he? Come on. Yeah. I'm sure you have a question. Sorry. Everything is so clear <laughs> that should be treated or not treated. <laughs> I think that always continues to be the issue uh, that when would we incorporate the all adverse imaging uh, tools. Uh, one thing which really came up is the FFR. That's the only uh, FFR slash IFR. Everything else has remained still experimental. Good. Nobody will criticize your 0.5, 50% lesion, your FFR is 0.75 and you put a cell. Anything else, we still, as you said last, last slide, that maybe. Uh, Ron, that was a superb talk, a uh, very difficult uh, subject and a subject that you and others have been leading for a long time. So I guess the question for you and for the audience to think about is, is intravascular imaging um, with its advantages, right? It's improved resolution, being able to look at the lipid. Is that really the tool that's ultimately going to crack this for us? Or, or is the work that Jagat's been doing over two decades and some of the earlier papers is non-invasive imaging the way to go? Because you're not only, you know, getting anatomy, now you're potentially looking at the plaque like you showed us years ago. Um, and, and as CT iterates, are we not going to get to a point where you can get the correlates of LCBI with CT, as, as you showed us, and then you're, you're adding the you know, physiology and the composition and other things? So that's, that's really the question. I think if you want to have an impact long term, that's the fundamental upstream question to ask. Absolutely. And we are in the empire of Dr. Fuster and Arula and all the yeah. imaging. Uh, look. There is no doubt what we're doing is all, only what we miss in the primary prevention. The primary prevention is the key. It's not only about the imaging, it's about all the treatment, but imaging for primary prevention made a tremendous impact. And I hope, again, even though, I don't mind, I have five, 10 years more to do <laughs> intervention, they'll kick us out from this career because this will reduce all the, and, and you know. <laughs> it's, it's no. No, he's not. <laughs> not <laughs> Just because the Fuster every year predicts I'll drive Sharma out of business. <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you, uh, it continues to increase business. Yeah. No, I'll tell you why it is, because they will find all those lesions 
ahead of time and they will refer us. So that's it. That's exactly. Ron, you're but very, very far off message for the <laughs> yeah, but but anniversary. I do think, I do think that uh, primary prevention is still key, and for that, it's all the non-invasive imaging. Unfortunately, we still have all those thousands and thousands of patients that come here. We just don't allow them to go to have another event. They're already in the lab. So all of the above devices are going to help somewhat. The OCT, the, the, the I was, But I think the beauty about this one, that we have a cutoff. Mm -hmm. It's like the FFR, going back to your question. And that's what I told Jim Muller. Let's find a number that we can rely on. More than 400 or less than 400? There are a lot of, obviously, gray zone, but also with FFR we have gray zone. But if we know that greater than 400, you need to treat with a safe device, then it's going to be changing um, the field. So I think nothing to take from uh, non-invasive. They are definitely good elite, and they're going to find a lot of those plaques eventually. Sure. But at the end of the day, they need to have a study like that that shows that by detection, the prediction and the correlates would be strong enough to detect those events. And that's, I think, what is missing right now on a big uh, scale. Let me do a question last time. Ron, uh, both uh, address to you as well as to Mike. Uh, see, you've got multi-modality vulnerable flag identification. The real question is going to be the predictive modeling. And I'm just wondering, more of the mic towards you. I mean, this is, to me, the answer here is AI. You're able to predict exactly which out of these yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, we make binary decisions, and here Ron picking a binary cut point, but biology is continuous. And in the cath lab in the future, I would envision that you would have all the stuff pulled in from the electronic medical record about age and lipids and all the risk factors, plus you would have multimodality imaging there, and rather than use bifurcations or cut points, you would use continuous variable modeling and AI to say for this one patient right here, what is their risk of an ischemic event? What is their risk of a bleeding event with a whole host of choices? So, um, you know, that's research shows us for the population. We anticipate this drug or device for the population will have this benefit. But what AI does is say, not for the population, but for an 83-year-old Russian woman with a creatinine clearance of this, with a, you know, uh, you know, uh, your number of 395, with an FFR of 0.7 or 0.83, you know, those gray zone areas, it could help us uh, reach uh, decisions in a way that's quantitative and, and evidence based. At the end, it's going to be all AI. So uh, 10 years from now, we're going to operate completely different. We don't have to make those decisions. We're going to get one line treat. What's then? what modality, and <laughs> you're going to do the best because there could be so much data incorporated into that. Uh, and then, other than Dr. Sharma, all the other will do it by robotic. <laughs> 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 all right, thank you, Ron. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. All right, I know Ron has to go, but great, great, great. Thank you for it. Now we continue. I know there are, so everyone has a little bit of time. The, maybe Dr. Gibson now, management of the patient with AFib and stent placement. Sorry. So maybe, uh, because I think uh, Habib's like the, the flight is slightly later, right? Um, if you better. Just a minute, it's a later flight. I see. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All right. Great. Well, again, congratulations on your longevity, the quality, and the quantity, both uh, for your conference. I'm going to talk about uh, data, about what you do in someone who has AFib and a stent. Uh, my disclosures are shown here. I have research grant support from all major manufacturers. I may be talking about doses of NOACs that are not in the product uh, label, consult the label. Claude has both platelets and thrombin strands, and we tend to focus on both acutely, but chronically we forget thrombin, and we just focus on the platelet. I think particularly when you have AFib, you've got to think again about thrombin. Thrombin is the most potent stimulant of your platelets. Uh, you know, one thing people don't realize is that aspirin and thionopyridines do nothing uh, to block the activation by thrombin, the most potent uh, intrinsic activator. Platelets calm down over time, but 
excess thrombin generation is the gift that keeps giving far after the acute event. This is a happy or angry platelet. Uh, platelets that are happy are round, but when they get angry and activated, they sprout these arms, which are called pseudopods, and they increase their surface area and view the platelet as a little mini manufacturer of thrombin. And it's increasing its surface area to make thrombin. That thrombin makes the platelet even angrier, so you have a positive feedback loop there. That's where antithrombins come in. The other thing that makes your platelet ag angry is ADP, and the platelet makes that. And that is a positive feedback loop as well, and that's where thionopyridines work. So you have two positive feedback loops that make sure a platelet goes from happy to really crazy, angry uh, immediately, uh, and there's a burst of activity. Now, as I said, this calms down over time, but two years later, two years later, thrombin generation on the coagulation side is still increased in people who had an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, so like cholesterol, some people may have excess thrombin generation as a uh, risk factor. Do the th antithrombins improve outcomes in the arterial side of things? The answer is yet. We now have two trials in upwards of 40 to 50,000 patients showing a reduction in mortality chronically when you inhibit the thrombin side of things in addition to the platelet side. There will be bleeding. Anytime you're more aggressive, there's going to be some bleeding. But the uptick in bleeding associated with uh, antithrombins is similar to the bleeding that we've accepted with more aggressive antiplatelet therapy. Uh, now, when you look at the net clinical outcomes and you look at fatal events, we all care about those. We care about irreversible events like ICH, MI, stroke. Over time, the benefit by adding an antithrombin in clinically, chronically uh, increases. That's the arterial side of things. Let's now look at the AFib side of things. All of you know that uh, compared to warfarin, the NOAC class uh, has reduced ICH by about half, and largely, that's probably largely what has driven uh, the reduction also in mortality with the use of these drugs. If you remember one slide, this is one of a few slides, it shows the crazy number of permutations we have in combining all these drugs. 2.8 million ways you could combine all of them. There are many more ways to give the drugs than there are patients. Sadly, we'll probably try all 2.8 million combinations. But uh, some of us want to try and create a little order here to understand what we should do. One of the problems is these two disorders are treated with different doses, and getting the dose right is very important. So on the arterial side, the dose is one quarter of that over on the AFib side. And this has given people a lot of concern when you combine these two. What's the right dose? Well, what could you do? Well, you could replace warfarin that gives you a lot of bleeding with an alternate anticoagulant. You could cut down on the dose to make things safer. You could drop an antiplatelet, or you could do some combination of all of the above. And of course, as interventional cardiologists, what did we do? Uh, we all did all of the above, right? So here's one example. I'm going to show briefly uh, you know, some of the trials that have been done in this area. This is a trial I led 2,100 patients who got a stent, who had uh, AFib, and you had three choices. You could do something like the Woos trial, where you drop, uh, you know, aspirin and just give an anticoagulant with a thionopyridine. Get rid of aspirin. The second strategy was what I would call ATLAS-like, the ATLAS trial I led, which is to use triple therapy, but with a very low dose of rivaroxaban, uh, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. And the third option was to give conventional triple therapy with warfarin. Most people uh, in the study received clopidogrel, and uh, most people received these combinations for 12 months. As many of you know, use of uh, the NOAC strategy here reduced bleeding by about 10%. You'd only have to treat 11 or 12 people to prevent a bleeding uh, event. These weren't just nosebleeds. 
at the bottom here, look at definite fatal bleeding. Three cases uh, total for the NOAX, seven for uh, the vitamin K strategy. Uh, keep in mind there were more NOAC cases. Giving you a p-value for the NOAC strategy for fatal bleeding of 0.019. So bleeding isn't just a nuisance. In this instance, it can also be fatal and this reduced fatal bleeding. What about efficacy? My EP colleagues uh, were quite, quite, quite worried saying, look, if you reduce the dose of NOACs or make these changes, you're gonna cause ischemic strokes. But what you see here is virtual superimposition of death in my stroke over the period of one year. So no real difference in outcomes. Keep in mind, there's always a trade-off. If you have a slightly lower non-significant, slightly lower non-significant risk of ischemic stroke with warfarin, you also face a counterbalancing slight increase in bleeding stroke. So net-net, the stroke rates are similar, but again, look over on the right side, the number of fatal bleeds is higher with warfarin, which I think tips the scale here. To the critics who said, you're doing harm by cutting down the dose in AFib, I show them this. It looks at the risk of cardiovascular hospitalization. It goes down by about 8% with the NOAC strategies. This isn't bleeding. This isn't bleeding, this is cardiovascular hospitalization. I just showed you the reduction in bleeding. You have about a 4% reduction in bleeding hospitalization. The point is the reduction in cardiovascular hospitalization is as great if not greater than the bleeding reduction. So uh, it does appear to be that you don't lose out in uh, efficacy. Another trial, another drug, dabigatran, two different doses, higher dose, low dose, uh, compared with triple therapy. Same lesson, less bleeding, uh, similar rates of ischemic events using an FDA criteria of an upper limit of the 95th percent confidence interval of 1.38. Most of these strategies show non-inferiority to uh, warfarin. I'm gonna show you a new concept. Think with me for just one second. It's a new way of combining safety and effectiveness data in one plot. So think about it. Uh, you want drugs and devices that are kind of down here. They're both safer and lower effectiveness event rates. You don't want drugs and devices that increase bleeding and increase uh, you know, hazard up in this quadrant. You can plot you know, what is the relative risk reduction in efficacy, and at the same time, you can plot what is the relative risk reduction in safety. So when you plot those simultaneously, you get a single point estimate here. Those two things have confidence interval, intervals around them, and that's how you can look at the statistical certainty. Well, here's what happens when you plot all the different kind of NOACs, uh, doses we'd studied uh, so far with the Redual and Pioneer. You see a significant 10% reduction in bleeding. That's why the curve goes to the left and you don't see any difference in efficacy. And the upper limit of that extends up to, I think, 1.12. So a very tight confidence interval around death of my stroke, uh, lying on the line of unity, no increased risk. Recently, apixaban uh, was studied in the Augustus trial, and I'm gonna show you now what we're publishing, combining all the data. When you look at all the trials done to date, uh, here as a reference is warfarin plus DAPT. That is the comparator. You see that uh, warfarin plus a thionylpyridine alone, a WUS-like strategy reduces bleeding. You see NOAC plus DAPT, a triple therapy but with a NOAC goes in the right direction. But a NOAC with just a thionylpyridine also reducing bleeding. And here's the punchline. On MACE, on efficacy, death of my stroke, absolutely, positively, no difference here with pretty tight confidence intervals uh, with respect to death of my stroke. So the guidance really is minimize the duration. I think we all do that. We have better stents now with thinner stent struts and better polymers uh, that allow us to use a shorter duration of therapies. 
Uh, if you're going to combine a NOAC with aspirin or clopidogrel, use the lowest approved dose. Uh, if you're going to give, say, Revo with aspirin and clopidogrel, use 15 milligrams, not 20 milligrams. I could give a whole talk on why that's the case. You get a lot more bleeding. And remember this one. Ticagor and Prazagril have not been studied on top of all these. And uh, don't combine those. That's a class 3 contraindication. We look back through our hospital records and... 30 to 40 percent of our patients were getting ticagrelor and prasagrelor on top of all these anticoagulants, and we've really had to make a change. Don't do that. Uh, you have to do what's in your patient's best interest. There might be some scenarios to do that, but in general, I think that might be best avoided. Well, thanks for having me here today, and uh, I really, really want to congratulate you guys. Great, great, great session. Keep up the great work. I hope you'll have me back again. The pioneer AFib, uh, our understanding has been uh, we give uh, aspirin on day one uh, sure. along with but it's 15 milligram of uh, rivaroxaban and the clopidogrel. Yeah. Very rarely patients, of course, uh, if they remain now uh, that they were because they came with acute coronary syndrome, MI, and they're already on uh, ticagrelor uh, and 90 milligram, although not steady, should we make 16 milligram twice a day? We make a trade off, but usually it's uh, <coughs> So clear cut 15 milligram and uh, um, and uh, clopidogrel 75 milligram. I know Anno actually gives aspirin is still about three months because the guidelines have not changed ours. Why our guidelines are still far behind that for a few months is still giving triple therapy. Yeah, we're we're somewhat uh, the people who've done all the trials. We meet and we we wrote a consensus statement not a guideline statement saying, guys, you need to change the guidelines to be in sync with all this data. And the data just continues to mount that you significantly reduce bleeding across all the trials. There's no increased risk of death in my stroke. So I, I think there is more and more consensus on this. I hope the guidelines catch up with the data. That's always a challenge. Okay. So Mike, that was terrific as well. So one of the questions for you is, um, I mean, the data are really impressive. They're heading in one direction. But to the point that Dr. Sharma is making, say you have a heavily thrombotic STEMI patient with AFib, um, and we know that the, the risk of stent thrombosis is actually highest in the first month in those STEMI patients. Um, I'll tell you, our practice has been to maybe give low-dose aspirin for a month and then stop it at the, with the acknowledgement that we're you know, buying extra bleeding. But what, what's your practice in a high thrombotic risk patient like STEMI, high thrombus burden? Do you not give any aspirin right off the bat? Oh, well, I want to make sure everyone understands everyone gets aspirin for, you know, the procedure and the day right. or two uh, surrounding that. It's right. not, we are, everyone's right, getting right. aspirin. Um, I do want to point out, you know, in Atlas, Rivaroxaban on top of aspirin and clopidogrel reduced stent thrombosis by 31%. Yeah. By turning down thrombin generation, you're yeah. turning down the thing that makes your platelets angriest. Uh, so, you know, we watched all this like a hawk, all the stent thrombosis mm -hmm. data in all of our trials. Bob Harrington was the chairman of the DSMB. There was never a signal that we were increasing stent thrombosis. Um, so, you know, every patient's different. <laughs> I would never want to give a, here's what you got to do kind yeah. of recommendation, uh, particularly, you know, if people get sued, and I've had to be a hostile witness in 1-800-BAD-DRUG cases, the guidance really is you have to balance efficacy and safety. If it is someone who's at low risk of bleeding, a young person, a male, good kidneys, okay. You know, that sounds perfectly reasonable. If it's a very old, frail person um, with known history of bleeding or blah, 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 then, then it might be best to back off. So every case is a little different. So you guys don't give a month of aspirin? We, uh, I, do, I do not. I just give most, my central tendency, with exceptions, is to give the 15 uh, plus the clopidogrel uh, with aspirin in the court hospitalization, right. and after that, the dual. And here are different also. I don't give, uh, Andu gives for one month, uh, but sometimes three months also, but one month. No. Yeah, three months for uh, left brain bifurcation, all complex. Sure, that, and that's a complex case, right? Sure, it, they, and that's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. After the day of procedure, but again, it's a little different. But key said that we may need to tailor made uh, in some patients. You ask three cardiologists, yeah. you get six answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's All right. Any okay. other questions?
Fantastic. Thank you. You need to go, you can. And uh, we continue with our last presentation, another which is actually was the theme today. So many of the slides which you are, I presented today, we, you'll see it now um, uh, the, from the master uh, with actually both of them, uh, both Narula and uh, uh, Habib. Sam, some of these uh, slides I used in my presentation happened to be. Uh, but this is the old FFR and IFR controversy in 2019, and I'm glad that uh, you're here, the master in this field. Well, I, I don't know about the master at all. I'm, I'm the student here, and I've, I learned a lot from today's case. And again, I want to congratulate you and thank you for the invitation. It is great to be here in the temple, uh, although um, some would argue that Emory is also the temple where <laughs> things started That's originally, <laughs> interventional <laughs> cardiology. <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's a great privilege. Let me say a quick word, because I left my disclosure slide out inadvertently, that we do get, um, I'm a consultant for Philips. We've had research grants from Abbott Vascular, from several of the companies. Uh, I'm also involved with Jack, and we do have a startup in the computational fluid dynamic space. So with that said, um, <clears throat> what I was going to do is spend some time talking to you about where we are in 2019 with lesion and vessel level assessment. We'll talk a little bit about FFR and IFR. I do think that we're moving towards these computational techniques, even in the cath lab, guys. Um, and then we want to talk a little bit about post-PCI assessment um, so we, we, we realize that if you have a lesion like this in the cath lab, it's, no one's going to need to put a wire across this. But the reason this is an important slide is for you guys to recognize that it's not just the minimal luminal area that drives the pressure drop across the stenosis, but it's actually the entrance forces, the frictional losses, and the separation losses. So it, it's quite complicated in terms of what drives the frictional forces. Um, and, and keep that in mind as you go to more moderate lesions. Now, there are a number of tools that have evolved over the years, physiologic tools. Most of you are familiar with fractional flow reserve, but there's instantaneous wave-free ratio, or IFR, and then there are a number of other resting indices, the simplest of which is PDPA, but there's also RFR, um, and DPR and HSR. And remember that if you're interested in the global flow that the distal myocardium gets, coronary flow reserve is still your best tool because coronary flow reserve gives you the summation of the epicardial and the microvascular resistance that your myocardial cells will see. And that's what you measure non-invasively by PET or MRI or other, or contrast echo. So uh, just a quick note about FFR. I know that it's used a lot in the cath lab here, but for those of you that don't have expertise with it, basically you're measuring your proximal pressure from the guide, your distal pressure from the sensor, and basically what you're doing is giving hyperemia so that your pressure can be minimal and constant, and then it's simply your distal divided by your aortic pressure that gives you your stenotic pressure drop. Now, many years ago, when we were at the University of Virginia, uh, and look how long ago this is, we were asking the very simple question is, how good is your eyeball at detecting a stenosis severity? This is old news now. You guys know that the eyeball is not that good. So if you're just looking at an intermediate lesion, your visual assessment has a diagnostic accuracy of 60%. Over the years, a number of studies then validated FFR against a number of non-invasive modalities with pretty good diagnostic accuracy. Remember, when FFR was coming onto the scene, the gold standard was non-invasive imaging. So it was kind of a circular argument. You had an angiogram with a moderate stenosis. You had to validate it against non-invasive ischemia. So in the last look at this. Since 2017, so we're talking 12 years, there have been a number of important trials uh, basically demonstrating the clinical validity and efficacy of FFR. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these because I know you guys are familiar with the data, but I do want to just simply show you what happens when you incorporate FFR into your practice. Most of you are familiar with Dr. Park in Korea, who, like Dr. Sharma in the U.S., Dr. Park is sort of our 
sort of Asian master of interventional cardiology. And what he did is he completely embraced using physiology in his cath lab. And what he told his whole team is that, look, beginning at a certain time point, I want you to incorporate FFR into your practice. And what this paper did is it compared the outcomes of all their PCIs and the blue before FFR was incorporated in their practice and compared it to after FFR. And you can see that by incorporating FFR in his practice, now remember the randomized trials are very simple lesions. Here he said, let's incorporate in our practice, you see improved outcomes of cumulative endpoints and repeat revascularization with physiology. The next question is, okay, I'm in the cath lab, what percent stenosis is such that I need to pull the wire? Is it a 40% lesion? Is it a 30? Is it a 70? Is it a 90? And these data are nice because you can see from the FAME study that if you have a 50 to 70% lesion, um, a third of the time they're hemodynamically significant, 70 to 90%, you might say, wow, I'm going to fix all of those. Well, 20% of the time they don't need fixing, and only when your stenosis is above 90% does that simple diameter stenosis uh, is very effective in, in identifying ischemia-provoking lesions. What about bypass grafts, right? Now, we don't think about this very often, but I don't know if your surgeons um, demand FFR here, but these are important studies. So if you're trying to advise your surgeons whether to put a graft on that 60% right coronary or that 70% LED, they should know that observationally, if your FFR before you place your graft is above 0.8, they've got a high likelihood of graft closure. Why would that be? Because you get competitive flow with the native artery. So FFR is pretty useful. And there was one retrospective study that compared angio versus FFR-guided bypass surgery. And while the hard outcomes were no different, it turns out that there was less angina when in follow-up when you've gone with your bypass FFR-guided. What do you guys do in the cath lab when you have a graft with a moderate lesion? Um, if you want to use physiology, um, basically you just go downstream to the graft and the native artery, whether the native artery is closed or not. The challenge there is that there's not a lot of outcomes data to guide you, but um, you could argue that for IVUS or any other modality as well. What about STEMI and multivessel disease? We know that about half of our patients that present with STEMI do have multivessel disease. We know that we're going to take care of the infarct-related artery. What do you do about the other vessels? Well, over the years now, we've learned that um, compared to managing the other vessels conservatively performing PCI on the non-culprit lesions seem to result in better outcomes. The question is, can FFR be used in that setting? And that was the subject of the Denami Permalti study, which used FFR, and the Compare Acute, which used FFR in the acute setting compared to a conservative approach. And the punchline here is that compared to treating the non-culprit vessels conservatively, an FFR-guided strategy results in better outcomes, at least better combined MACE outcomes. And that's why I, I assume your practice here, Dr. Sharma, is to be aggressive uh, with the other vessels. Uh, but certainly the guidelines are moving in the direction of recommending at least consideration of revascularization of the non-culprit vessels. All right, so your patient comes in with unstable angina. They may or may not have had a troponin release. They come to the cath lab, and now they've got a 60% LAD and a 60% right. What do you do? Can FFR be used in that setting? A number of years ago, we basically asked the question, does FFR reflect myocardial ischemia? And when we used SPECT, myocardial contrast echo is the gold standard, we found this was several years ago where at that point the cutoff of FFR was 0.75 and not 0.8. We found that a cut point of 0.78 identified ischemia on non-invasive imaging. And subsequent studies have shown that you've got to be very careful with using FFR in the culprit vessel. And it may be that a higher cut point of maybe 0.84 is a better predictor of um, whether you should treat the vessel or not. And the reason for that is what? The reason for that is kind of what Dr. Waxman was talking about earlier, that when you present with acute coronary syndromes, you might be dealing with a vessel like this, which might give you a hazy lesion. This is an OCT image with a ruptured plaque. 
Here, whether your lesion is hemodynamically significant or not may not be the bigger driver. The question is, is the lesion stable or unstable? Is it best treated with a stent? Is it best treated with optimal medical therapy? And the truth is that to this day, most of us will be very aggressive revascularizing patients that present with true ACS regardless of the lesion severity. A couple of words about um, what do you do when you have a patient that comes in and they have FFR positivity. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who thinks that putting a stent in an FFR positive patient that has stable disease is gonna improve your outcomes? So you, you have a patient comes in, stable CAD, they have a 75% LAD lesion, you place a wire, your FFR is 0.75, okay? By putting a stent, are you gonna improve uh, death and MI? No. no, you don't. You're treating ischemia, you're treating angina, and this was the subject of this study, which basically randomized FFR positive patients to PCI versus medical therapy, and what they found in FAME2 is that if you were FFR positive and you were treated medically, you did have a higher event rate, but this higher event rate was not death and MI, it was just repeat revascularization. And if you put a drug-eluting stent, you reduced your, your overall event rates, right? And if you take this out to five years, it seems like PCI is better for improving overall outcomes, but if you look at just death and MI, uh, it seems like PCI doesn't give you a statistical advantage, right? So for stable CAD, that's not the case. And subsequently, there was a larger meta-analysis that suggests that maybe FFR-guided PCI is better. But in aggregate, I think most of us agree that for stable CAD, it's not. And that's where um, the idea of taking the physiology to the next level comes up. Um, this idea of wall shear stress um, is something that's been around for a long time, and there's a lot of vascular biology that suggests that if you have areas in blue of low wall shear stress, like in the inner curvature of aortas and the outer hips of bifurcations, that these areas are associated with plaque progression. But if you have areas of high wall shear stress, you get plasmin production and matrix metalloproteinases that are activated that soften the plaque and potentially render it more vulnerable. Several years ago, we looked at this prospectively in patients, a small cohort of patients with, treated with high-dose statins. Um, and basically what we did is we did IVUS at baseline and six months follow-up. And what we found is that if you have an area of high wall shear stress, that six months later you get regression of overall plaque but that's driven by the stable actors. Your fibrotic core, your fibrotic plaque goes down, but your necrotic core goes up. So we observed that if you have high wall shear stress over time, that segment over six months becomes more vulnerable, even if you're treating the patient with high dose statins. And it was based on that that we um, looked at this study uh, that was recently published with, in collaboration with Bernard de Bruyne, and our first author were Beth Thompson and Arnav Kumar. And basically what we did is we looked at wall shear stress and FFR positive patients, and we propensity matched those patients that had MI with those that didn't have MI. And what we found is that if your wall shear stress is high, Remembered all the, all the graphs that my good friend Dr. Waxman showed you earlier? That was all cumulative events of revascularization, death, and MI. This was, you know, adjudicated myocardial infarction, right? So it was harder endpoints, and it was predicted by this vascular biology biomarker of wall shear stress. And when we looked at FFR and we compared it to wall shear stress, wall shear stress, high wall shear stress, and the proximal edge had a higher predictive value for MI at three years. Here's an example of an angiogram and a wall shear stress computational map from a patient with an FFR of 0.71, right? And then here's a different patient also with an FFR of 0.71, right? And both these patients were treated medically based on the trial. This was an observational arm of the trial, but this patient had a high wall shear stress at the proximal edge wall shear stress of seven. This patient had a lower wall shear stress, and this patient ended up having an MI, and this didn't, 
right? So again, this is uh, hard endpoints. And obviously, these are early data, and we're looking forward to testing that in larger data sets. Um, now, I mentioned IFR. I want to quickly take you through this just to tell you that compared to, I, compared to FFR, IFR has been found to be non-inferior with respect to outcomes. That's the uh, defined flare and the sweetheart studies. And then look at this data set, 4,500 patients, large data sets. If you're guiding your revascularization compared to F based on FFR, you're going to defer 45% of the time. And you're going to send 48% of your patients to bypass, sorry, for to PCI and 7% to bypass. And actually, with IFR, you end up spe sending fewer patients for revascularization uh, compared to FFR. Um, and yet, your outcomes are very similar with IFR and FFR. So some people have argued that this, and I think a lot of the companies are moving towards these resting indices because they're quicker and simpler, and it appears that they're giving you similar results. Um, and there's some signal that in some subgroups, IFR may actually be slightly better than FFR because you're not dependent on the variable hemodynamic effects of the vasodilator. Well, if you do both IFR and FFR, about 15% of the time they're going to be discordant. Your, either your IFR is going to be abnormal, FFR, or vice versa. And this elegant study by Bon Kwan Ku's group shows us that if you're discordant, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You could always treat those patients conservatively because this study shows us that if you're concordantly abnormal with your IFR and your FFR, your outcomes are worse than if you're discordant or either one is normal. Um, so I think there's more work that needs to be done in this space. But it's exciting for those of us that have been in this field that this invasive physiologic testing, which started as this kind of quacky thing uh, by Nico Peels and Bernard de Bruyne and others has now made it into the mainstream of clinical practice. Um, and I just want to show you because it's, I know it's kind of, you know, it's, uh, going on a little bit, but the Syntex 2 study was a nice study because it incorporated contemporary PCI, IFR guidance, IVIS, CTO PCI, and compared it to traditional PCI, which is just angio-guided stenting, and showed a better outcome. Now, this was not a randomized study. It was an observational <laughs> study. But it appears as though modern PCI with physiology and imaging uh, results in better outcomes with myocardial infarction, repeat revascularization, stent thrombosis may be better. And even compared to bypass, a contemporary PCI approach may be non-inferior. Um, and regardless of what your syntax score is. So where are we with physiologic lesion assessment and patient outcomes? I would say that both FFR and IFR are equivalent now. Use them as you will. Um, it's important to note that FFR guidance of the non-culprit artery and STEMI and multivessel disease patients can be used and are helpful. As I mentioned, IFR is non-inferior to FFR. But for ACS, I would be careful and I'd probably use an FFR cutoff that's higher or use intravascular imaging. Um, and then finally, we're sort of excited about this idea of wall shear stress being incorporated uh, with future studies to see what the, um, whether it has predictive value. What I'm going to do is, in the interest of time, I'm going to just go to my final slide and, and just say that um, I skipped post-PCI post assessment because I think Dr. Sharma covered it quite well this morning. But I hope that in 2019 and beyond, um, both computational and invasive assessments of FFR are in our mainstream. I think a lot more work has to be done, but um, it's an exciting time to be part of the journey. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, I have a question about the resting FFR, all the family, whatever yeah. we use, yeah. right? whether it is IFR. Or, IFR has a little different connotation as compared to the angiographic uh, assessment. Right? The reason that the FFR picks up is either you have got a very severe stenosis, mm -hmm. which we are missing some of, or some other features. Or the second thing is that it has got a big, as Dr. Sharma earlier showed, that it might have a big uh, lipid pool somewhere, right? And that has stretched the smooth muscle cell to an extent 
that it cannot go any further when you will give the adenosine or nitroglycerin to these people. So if nitroglycerin is already there, is understandable. But if there is no vasodilator, I think that functional or dynamic stenosis phenomenon is not going to play out. So I am a little afraid about where we are heading. Yeah. The reason being that whenever you create four quadrants mm -hmm. and try and compare FFR with IFR or IFR with RFR or whatever else it is, there always will be 80, 60, 70 percent of people who will be in those two quadrants which will match. Mm -hmm. But we will be always missing out on these. And ultimately, your R value comes out to be very good. Yeah. Right. So unless we really go with good bland Altman analyses or like uh, keep the narrow range there, I think it will fool us probably. In that case, I am totally overwhelmed by your WSS strategy. It is superb, undoubtedly. Thank and that's what we did when we did the editorial on that paper. Thank you. That we, we, we thought that this is, this is the way it is going to end up. Right? So how do you react to the RFR strategy? No, that, that's a great point. And I obviously, I'm, I've been an admirer of your work for a long time. Um, so what, what I would say is, is two things. Um, the first is that um, the, the relationship that you're describing between a positive FFR and what goes on in the vessel wall is very provocative. And there are certainly, as you point out, observational data that link the two. But let, let me say this, is that um, everything we know about fluid dynamics and everything we know about pressure drop that occurs across stenoses, from a cause and effect standpoint, ignore the wall. Right? So, you know, and we've been working with this computational fluid dynamics for a while, is that it's really the lumen, but it's not just the, the two-dimensional lumen. As we talked about for the guys, it's the three-dimensional lumen. It's relationship to the branch points, it's eccentricity, all of that complex 3D geometry that for sure drives the pressure drop across the stenosis. Now, the next question is, what's the impact of the vasodilation and the microvasculature? I think that there's observational relationships between what goes on in the vessel wall, all the things you've taught us, the positive remodeling, the soft plaque, et cetera, and issues with the microvasculature. I think there's a lot of crosstalk. There may be embolization. There may be the similar pathophysiologies that drive the positive remodeling and the microvascular issues. Um, but the other variability with FFR is that everyone's response to the vasodilator is highly variable. And, and that variability we've learned a lot over the years. It's not only driven by you know, whether you've had caffeine in the last 24 hours, but it's driven by you know, your microvascular status and so forth. And the other challenge with FFR is that we've seen some patients that have like a 40% lesion in the proximal LED on the left main, where they have zero resting gradient, and then you give them adenosine, and if you measure their coronary flow reserve, it goes up to six. And if you do a PET, it's completely normal, but suddenly, because you've increased the flow seven times, that 30 to 40 percent lesion has now created almost like a pseudo gradient like you get with thyrotoxicosis or with anemia or something like that on the aortic valve. So, what we don't want to do is make it confusing and complicated. Um, and and I, I agree that, you know, the, the challenge I have with the resting indices beyond what you just eloquently described of those observational relationships, the challenge I have is the range is narrower, right? And if the gradient range is narrower, if you get one or two points of drift or three points of drift of your wire, then it's going to bounce you one way or the other. So there are clearly some challenges with the resting indices. But the issue with FFR, and by the way, I do want to show you this slide. Now remember, this slide is not an observational comparison. These are outcome studies. So this is the comparison of 4,500 patients randomized to either IFR or FFR. And this is 12 months MACE, and you know, it's 
even though both of the studies were two separate studies, they were designed to be joined. So when I looked at these, because I was skeptical too, like you, I mean, for 15 years, I've been talking about FFR, um, but it, it seems like an aggregate, some of the issues with the vasodilator, that challenge that you have with FFR, um, balances itself out with some of the issues you have with drift. Um, and ultimately, from a prognostic standpoint, I don't think the answer is only the pressure drop. The answer is what's in the vessel wall, the answer is the wall shear stress, and it's gonna be a multimodality. So I think for clinical use, in my mind, um, if, if I'm on the fence, like someone's FFR is borderline, the IFR is borderline, it's the left main, I will go ahead and IVUS those patients too, uh, because the stakes are high. But otherwise, for my clinical use now, I've, you know, I'm pretty much using these wristing indices. So if I could add to that, yeah. I mean, it's a fabulous answer to that. I mean, one important thing here is that the IFR is different than the resting gradient, right? Yeah. The reason being that here you have got the maximum flow through the diastole. Absolutely. Right? So that yeah. is one big thing which we have. Yeah. So one important thing. Secondly, when you talk about the, um, the uh, left main, 40% really makes sense because that are the black off limit. So yeah. I'm certain, or at least I presume, that it has a big necrotic code sitting there, which is causing the problem at 40%. While the same thing happens at 60% if I go to LED, mm -hmm. right? Again, going to the Glagos limit. And our paper just came out in circul uh, circulation cardiovascular intervention, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you saw, mm -hmm. where we talked about the uh, the area uh, uh, remodeling index. Yeah. And it actually fits into the Glagos hypothesis completely, which we earlier didn't realize. Yeah. So question only is that, uh, when we are going towards perfection, uh, you know, like I mean, yeah. we are yeah. 2019, iterating, yeah. Going ahead, we should not be uh, talking about the fuzzy science anymore. Yeah. You know, like we have got to be a little more specific that, okay, IFR is almost as good as FFR, and that's almost as good as RFFR. <coughs> and we just go ahead. I think we have to be now a little more uh, effective. So that's why I push uh, CT and geography all the time. Yeah. But at least I can see the plaque. Now I can do the FFR can give you the drop of uh, the pressure at every single uh, plaque level. Mm -hmm. yeah? So mm -hmm. we, we have a lot to, so you will be able to nullify the effect of the, uh, the microvasculature there, CFR, because you are dropping between the two lesions. Mm -hmm. So probably non-invasive might help you. Very much uh, so. Much more. And I tell you that ACC AHA guidelines, which are coming in, and will be presented in November, I think we will see a big change. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting right. times. Okay, Marianne, last question last for the question. day. Um, you know that the microvasculature can differ in men and women from the hormonal changes. Yes. And I haven't seen any differences in analysis in FFR between men and women, but anecdotally in the lab we see it market changes in some women. Just like the tiger tubos, which are probably best predominantly for females to be well, actually, you're absolutely right, and, um, and so it turns out, you know, women, there are a bunch of things that are different, right? The resting flow tends to be a little higher, the hyperemic flow tends to be a little lower, and there's some data that I've seen from Bill Furon's group that in women, for the same diameter stenosis, the same other conditions, the overall FFR tends to be a little higher in women, as you point out, because you don't get that vasodilatory reserve. And that's the comment I made to Dr. Narula is that, you know, listen, I, I think that you can't go wrong in 2019 using FFR to guide yourself, but you just have to be aware that the microvasculature does play a role in FFR, probably more so than it plays into IFR or the resting indices. And that's both good and bad. It may be good because you're, you're investigating the microvasculature, but if you're just trying to make a decision about the epicardial stenosis, which we are in the lab, yep. uh, then the resting indices are, I think, less dependent on that microvascular variability. And actually, the microvasculature is coming back. The, there was the era of epicardial and now microvasculature and all the parts and so many papers now on the, uh, the of, of overall uh, the CRR, C, CFR, and uh, all the mic resistance with the MRI with uh, and few of the papers which you showed. The problem is we can't do anything to it. Yeah, that's right. all it is. That's yeah. our only problem. That's the only right. Thing you can fix is the that's right. right. Well, with that so, note, it comes to the great, uh, uh, I would say, end of our uh, fantastic educational symposium.
uh, this morning and of course celebration on the 20th. And Habib, thank you very thank much you. for coming thank here. Thank you so and much for having me. To all the audience, to our faculty and the fellows.